Hi, welcome to MEN 368. Uh, right now we are going to do a simple example, you know, of using the various uh, critical loads for buckling to figure out how to design something. Okay. So just to give us a very quick re recap of what buckling is all about. So we tried this problem. If you remember, we had a very simple situation where we had a pin joint, another pin jointed and we were applying a force. And what happened was because of this force, the thing buckled. There was a pin joint and then this, this thing buckled and we had a force like that. And we took a free body diagram here. And when we took the free body diagram, we got something that looked like that. And we had F and this deflection was Y. And this point was at Y equal to X equal to zero. This length is X. And then we had Y equal to zero at X equal to zero. Invariably, when we solve this problem, we found that the deflection is given by y equals some a sine root of f over ei times x. This is what we got. And for non-trivial solutions, for non-trivial solutions, we found that square root of f over ei was equal to pi over l. So what happens is you'll get a bubble like thing and we talked about this positive feedback and all that stuff. Okay. So what happens if I use a different boundary condition? Let's say I didn't have this, but I had something different, which was like a built in beam. And I applied a force F here. It turns out you will get the same equation. Y is still a sine or cosine appropriately some square root of F over EI times X. Now what happens is you will find that F over EI is something like 4 pi uh, over L whole square. Sorry. You'll get something like that. Okay. Invariably, no matter what boundary condition you use, you will find that you will get something like F over EI equals uh, some constant times pi squared over L squared. So I can group these terms in a nice way and I can write this as F over A, which is sigma critical equals some constant pi squared E over what is called the slenderness ratio F over K squared. So the C depends upon boundary conditions. For pin pin joint, C is one. For other joints, you'll get different things. But always you will get this. This is called the Euler formula for bucking. Okay. And so you will get sigma critical. And by the way, K is square root of I over A, where I is the amount of inertia and A is the area of the cross section. And this is called radius of gyration. So let us summarize. We have this. According to the Euler formula, that's the critical load C pi squared E over L over K. This is the sigma critical. So if I want to find P critical, I just multiply it by area and I'll get it. And the different values for C are given here. These recommended values typically come from here, yeah, the American Society of Civil Engineers or something like that. So they will actually look at this and say, use this value, so on. You can see that for fixed, fixed and, and pin, pin, one fourth and one are okay. But for fixed pin, you, they will, they will say use 1.2 and fixed, fixed, you use 1.2. Okay. So this is the idea. Excellent. But what happens is it's easy for you to get situations in which the critical load far exceeds the yield strength. So what will happen is it will fail earlier. So in those cases, what do we do? It turns out that this is the yield stress. And you cannot, your, your critical load cannot exceed your yield stress. I mean, that's it. It's going to fail. So what happens is this is this parabolic equation. So this is the safe region. 
the safe region is this so let me draw the safe region so it's this this is given by a parabolic formula this is an empirical formula by the way and then this part is called the euler formula here we are going to use a p critical equal to uh, pi squared e uh, times c over l over uh, um, l over k whole square here we are going to use a parabolic curve called the j b johnson formula and this point where you switch over from the Euler curve to the parabolic curve is given by this value. This is called the critical value of slenderness. Okay, so what happens in the end is the following. You got two situations. This is the J.B. Johnson curve. And this is the curve if L over K is greater than L over K1 and this is that and by the way just to notice this is yield stress this is modulus this is boundary constant okay these are the things that matter okay so we are going to figure out which so when we want to use this i have to calculate the slenderness ratio that is l over k first then i have to figure out whether i am on this side of the curve or on that side of the curve if it is on this side of the curve i'm going to use this formula if it's on this side of the curve then i will use that formula okay so the easy thing to do is set up an excel spreadsheet where i have both the formulae and then just figure out which side of the curve I'm going to be on and use the appropriate one. Okay. So let us see how this works. So we're going to do a, actually a design problem with some information given and some things that are not. So here's the deal. So we have to, we have to jack up a beachfront house. Think of like Galveston or something like that. You're, you, you just got a nice beachfront house and because of hurricanes and other thing, other stuff, you want to be off the ground. So the idea is you want to be 10 foot above the grade level. Okay, so you got these 10 foot columns and you're going to be use, using steel. So you have a certain number of steel columns. You've made a rough idea. How much does the house weigh? How many steel columns you need? So how much load per steel column you're going to take? And if you got a steel column, you know you always have this problem of buckling because the column is under compression. So what happens is you have to apply a load of 200,000 pounds. Okay, so off you go and you want to do this calculation. So you want to look at one of the possible two designs. You want to do a hollow circular shaft or you want to do a hollow square shaft. Those are the two possibilities. Okay, so how do you do this? You don't have enough information. No, you just know it's steel. What kind of steel? What size should you pick? You know, at least we know how tall it should be and how much load it can take. It should take 200,000 pounds and it's got to be about 10 feet tall. That's all we know. So what are you going to do? You have to make certain a priori judgments. So let's just draw. So a priori. Let us say I pick a steel with sigma y or sy, which is the yield stress of 60 ksi. And, uh, and since it is steel, the Young's modulus will be the same no matter what kind of steel you pick. So this is a reasonable level steel. I mean, that's a commonly available steel. Okay, so you can just go and pick one of them and then you're going to pick, you have a yield strength, I mean, a Young's modulus of 30,000 KSI. Okay, also, you now have to decide on cross-sectional diameters and things like that. So you go look around and you think, okay, how big should I want? I'm going to randomly say, okay, it's about eight inches. Eight inches is about that big. Okay, that's about eight inches. 
Oh, that's a solid steel tube. Can you see that? Okay, that's eight, inch, eight, eight inches OD, outer diameter. So what do you do for the inner? You just kind of pick like 10% less. Okay, typical number, if you don't know what to pick, just pick like 10% of eight, which will give you, you know, 7.1, 7.2, something like that. Don't pick those kinds of things, pick seven. Make sense to you? So your outer diameter eight, inner diameter seven. You can find a tube like that. Okay. Typical idea is make a 10% guess and see it will work. If it does, then you're okay. Okay, so now we are ready to plunge into the details. So I'm going to go in. So first I'm going to set up this thing. So first thing I have done is yield stress is 60 KSI. Modulus. So that's this one equal to 30,000. This is based on my choice of steel. Okay. Next thing, I'm going to pick a round tube. Okay. Then I'm going to say, because I, I need to show this a little bit better, I'm going to blow it up a little bit so that you can see these numbers. There, yeah, that's better, right? So outer diameter, I'm going to pick eight inches because this is um, just based on eyeball. This is based on 10% smaller. And rounded. Now I need to find the radius of gyration. This is, how do I find this? So let us go. And I'm going to put K equals square root of I over A. So I for a hollow tube is pi over 64 d outer to the fourth minus d inner to the fourth. A for the hollow tube equals pi over 4 d outer squared minus d inner squared. So it's a tube like that d outer d inner. Okay. If you compute it for our values, it will turn out that your radius of gyration is 2.65. Of course, I have, it, you know, if you look at my calculation, it will, it will tell you uh, that it's 2.657536, but all these other additional numbers are useless. I know that the length is 10 feet. So please be careful. I made this mistake. So I don't want you to make it. Make sure you put 120 inches. Okay. Remember, look at the units here, all inches. So slenderness ratio is the ratio between this guy and that guy, length and radius of gyration. So this is 120 divided by 2.657 and that will give me 45.115. Okay. The next thing I want to do is I need to figure out the boundary constant, which is C. So how do I figure out the boundary constant? Well, I need to know the boundary condition. So I got this house. Right? Here are the pillars, right? The bottom of the pillars are fixed. So at least this end is fixed. What about the top? I want you to understand that we don't really know what's going to happen in the top. But I know it's going to move around in the top. It's not fixed in the top. It's going to sway. Correct? So I should pick. That's what is going to cause the instability. Can you see that? One end is going to sway with respect to the other like this. That's what is going to cause the instability. So I'm going to assume that the top is free. So how did I assume that? Of course, what it means is free means sideways free. Up and down there is force, right? It looks like this. Each pillar looks like that, right? So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to look for fixed free from my Nice little setup. There you go. I wanted to say fixed free. Ha! Huh, there you go. Theoretical value is one, one, one quarter. Conservative value is one quarter. So that's what I want to use. 
So I go off here. Oops. So I'm going to pick one quarter. Then I'm ready to calculate the critical slenderness. How do I calculate that? I go up and I have my nice little formula for my critical slenderness. L, L over K critical, which turns out to be here. I'll show you where it is. We are now ready to figure out whether L over, whether I should use the JB Johnson formula or the Euler formula. So the critical slenderness formula is here. 2 pi squared C E S Y to the power half. So I know C, this is 0 0.25, E is 30,000, S Y is 60 KSI, this is 30,000 KSI, this is 0.5. I'm going to calculate that, substitute in there, and what will I get? I'll get 49 inches, this is 45 inches. So the slenderness is less than the critical slenderness. So what does it mean? I am actually in a, sh this is actually a short column. This is not a long column, this is a short column. Okay, so once I got the short column, I can go ahead and I can use the JB Johnson formula. If I use the JB Johnson formula, it will tell me that my yield stress, that my critical stress is 35 KSI. So if my critical stress, vertical compressive stress on my column exceeds 35 KSI, this column is going to fail. Okay, of course I calculated the Euler case and you can see in the, in the region where we are interested, that's the Euler one is always higher. So 35 KSI, how much load will it give me? Let us see. So 35 KSI, so critical load is 35 KSI, so I'm going to say 35 times, so I'm going to say equals, it's four, it's the force is the stress times area, right? So it is 35, 1, 2, 3, that is 35,000 PSI times area is pi over 4 times d naught square. What is d naught square? d naught square minus di square. So all I did was I took the critical stress, multiplied it by the area, and let's see how much. It's only going to give me like 412,000 uh, pounds. How much did I want? I want 200,000. So it's going to give me 412. Am I safe? Am I not safe? I got a factor of safety of 2. I may want more. Suppose I wanted a factor of safety of 4. It's not safe. So the question is, ultimately it comes to this thing about factor of safety. How do we decide factor of safety? So factor of safety is decided by the following thing. Just to get you some idea about factors of safety, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. So I have three um, there are three deciding factors, material, environment, and how accurate is my model. Material, what do I mean? Was the actual material tested or did you look it up? So that's the first question. If my actual material of tested was tested, so this is actual material tested. Then you put a factor of 1.3 for it. If I looked for similar material, then I'm going to put a factor of safety of 2. If I had what else? Uh, representative. I'll put a factor of safety of three. So I only have very crude 
experimental data which means factor of safety of 4 okay how about environment so environment i tested So it's 1.1.3. Notice how we how we have done. Okay, similar environment. I will put two. Then not really similar environment. I'll put three, and then I really don't know. I'm going to put four. four. See what I mean? How good is my model? So, actual model tested. I'll put 1.3. You get the picture, right? Similar. It's a pretty good model. And I'll put factor of safety of 2. Even though it's not tested, I think it's a pretty good idea. And then I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say challenging uh, approximate. Then I'll put 3. And then if it's really bad model, I'm going to put 4. Okay, so what happens? I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, okay, in our case, I chose a material which was actually tested and reported. So I'm going to do 1.3 for that. It was not tested. If I'm going to do seaside environment, I'm really concerned because there will be corrosion and other things. I did not account for it. So I'm going to put a factor of safety of about three <coughs> because I'm thinking it's not such a crude test, but maybe three. And then my model is pretty good. So I'll put a factor of safety of another two. So three to the six. I'm going to put about factor of safety of 7 for this. Can you see that? So, if I put a factor of safety 7, that's huge. I'm thinking, man, factor of safety of 7. Yes, that's right. So, I want you to understand, when you're, when you're looking at buildings and things like that, the factor of safety will be very large. Okay? So, it's clearly not safe. But if I have a factor of safety of 7, because I need to carry 200,000, it's only carrying 400, 413,000 pounds. So I need to really up the dimensions. So I'm going to go up here and instead of making it 8 inches, I'll make it 10. I'll make this 9. Let's see what happens. 35, 49. Now it's 44 KSI. I'm now in much better situation. I'm at 522. I may need to make it bigger. But I need you to understand that this is how the process works. Okay. So in class, we will talk a little bit more about how these designs are done and so on. Thank you.